of his terror are for the purpose of us understanding that he became like us. And so he is tender toward our needs. He's tender toward our fears. So that whatever we're going through, we know that he went through worse. Right? Nothing was as horrifying as bearing our sin. That he was a sacrifice in our place. Or what scholars call the substitutionary atonement or the sacrifice where we deserved to die and he died in our place. That's the gospel. He died in our place so that we would live with him forever. Or as I've mentioned, my old pastor in Westcliff, he used to say this a lot. Uh, he loved us so much that he would rather die than be without us. That's a beautiful thing. That's how much he loved us. That's how much he cared for us. So as we see his heartbeat, <laughs> we feel his anguish as he was about to endure the cross, uh, that we might be uh, comforted through our trials, whatever they are, and understand the depths of his sorrow. So one of the things that we emphasized in the last Mm, three, four psalms, is these fears about people's tongues, right? Well, Jesus was surrounded by that. And while we think about different fears of, you know, mountain lions, rabid goats, I don't know, I've never run into one, but it just sounds good. Think about all the terrors you might think of, you know, being on a roller coaster and it just, you know, flying off the rails. That could be scary. But this never happened to me, thankfully. Um, or walking in the dark. Being scared of mad hackers or hatters. What are they called? Ha both? You know, when they, they're chasing you through your house with <laughs> some sort of weird instrument. Or when you have family members that are hurtful and that are abusive. And if, you, if you've grown up with maybe an, an abusive father or had an abusive spouse and were scared, um, as we think about Jesus and what he endured and that he was constantly looking to the Father for comfort, may that bring us comfort as we um, really contemplate what he went through, okay? So it had to do with tongues, accusations, and that's what the people of God went through before Jesus came. They went through accusations. The self-righteous were looking at them and saying, how could you call yourself a believer when you committed adultery or when you broke the Sabbath? Or, you know, when you offered a blemished sacrifice or something like that, how could you call yourself a believer? And so finally, though, they brought those accusations against Jesus. They were constantly accusing him of being a sinner. And then there, as he was on the cross, he was actually bearing sin. And rather than having compassion upon him, the self-righteous Pharisees were judging him and saying, if you are the son of God, what? Get yourself off that cross. You claim to be almighty God, the lamb of God. You claim to be the redeemer, the Messiah. Ha, they were, like the Bible says, they were shooting out the lip. That was an old, that, right? That was a, that was a very mean thing to do back then. You know, we have our different things. You know, for us, we have things like the birdie, <laughs> right? Well, I'm, I doubt they had, well, I'm sure they had something like that, but it probably wasn't the middle finger, but they would shoot out the lip and the Bible says they mocked him and they wagged their heads. That was another thing that they would do to show their disdain for the Savior. They wagged their heads and they surrounded him. And he said that they were, there were bulls and lions and, and dogs surrounding him. He was terrified. You have to remember that. Jesus was terrified. And so that's what we see here in this psalm, again, continuing that theme. And, and 
I, I don't want you to grow discouraged with these Psalms. God gave us the Psalms to understand the heart of Jesus as he was about to die for you, right? In fact, Peter says that. Consider, consider Jesus, lest you grow weary, who when he was reviled, what? Did not revile in return, but committed himself to God who judges righteously. So he was accused, fiercely accused, more than we could possibly imagine. And so, as I mentioned before, you know, when people gossip about us, they haven't told anywhere near what's really in our hearts. <laughs> so, you know, lighten up. I know that's easier said than done when people accuse us. But lighten up on the accusers and remember that Christ's blood vindicates you. Amen? Amen. That you're forgiven. All right, here we go. Let's read it. Psalm 6, verses 1 through 10, the whole psalm. And this is Jesus. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger. Of course, we know under the Old Testament, God was angry at sin. Okay? But the Bible says his anger endured for a moment, but that when Messiah would come, what? Joy comes in the morning. Daylight. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He's called the day star. He's called the son of righteousness. And he arose with healing in his wings, as Malachi says, and he brought healing to us. The word of God says, with his stripes, we are what? Healed. Healed. You see that in Isaiah. You see First Peter, he quotes it, quotes Isaiah 53. Okay. So God poured out his anger and his wrath and the discipline and punishment that was due unto us was poured out on Jesus. Think about that. Meditate on that every single day. Every day. Never let a day go by where you don't meditate on the love of God that Christ demonstrated. In fact, Romans 5 says this. God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet, what? Sinners, Christ died for us. He wants us to think about that all the time because that is how he demonstrated his love. Don't you want to know you're loved by God, right? Well, man, the times we need it most are when we've disobeyed and we feel like God doesn't love us. And he says, no, look to the cross. I took care of that 2,000 years ago. It's the most beautiful thing. So here he is. Do not rebuke me in your anger. Do not discipline me in your wrath. Or as Jesus said in so many words, Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am what? Languishing. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are shaking with terror. Never think that Jesus didn't experience the type of fear that could come upon us when we feel like God doesn't love us. We can get so scared. I've been there. I've been there. I've been there. I, I, my first uh, pastorate, if you want to call it, was a college pastor right here in, ta- or in Auburn at Calvary Chapel. I was a college pastor. And then I became a pastor for five years. My biggest fears came after I was a pastor. My most scary moments of God, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you care? Were after I'd become a pastor. So never think to yourself, oh, you know, I'm just not a mature enough Christian. That's why I'm going, no, no, no. It has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with that. I'd read the Bible so many times. I'd memorized thousands of verses, seriously. And I still went through this kind of fear. And I think what God is just telling us is go back to the cross. Every time, go back to the cross. Be gracious to me, Jesus says. Oh Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, for my bones are shaking with terror. My soul also is struck with terror. While you, oh Lord, how long? Isn't that interesting? It's almost as if I like this New Revised Standard Version of this passage. He's, He's like, while you, and then he stops. Oh Lord, how long are you going to take me through this? How long am I going to endure bearing sin? Turn, O Lord, save my life. Deliver me for the sake of your steadfast love. 
Jesus was constantly focused on the love of the Father as he was here, born of a woman, born under the law of Moses. For in death, now watch this, in death there is no more remembrance of you. And that was true under the old covenant. When they would die, that was it. They were longing for the future when God would bring them out of Sheol, right? Some people think, oh, Sheol is a place. You know, there are lots of weird doctrines out there that try to imagine that during that time under the old covenant, they were conscious or they were suffering. No, they were dead. This is what it says. In death, there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who can give you praise? And so here's Jesus. His whole life was characterized by praising the Father. And he says, are you going to leave me in the grave? How long? Jesus, you know, again, I, I've said this so many times in these psalm studies. It's okay to question God. It's okay to ask why. But to know that Jesus is why how long, when, Lord, that his prayers were finally answered. When God delivered him and raised him up from the dead, he conquered death, and we now have that everlasting life. And so we no longer have to say, Lord, when are you going to give me everlasting life? When are you going to bring forgiveness? We get to say, Lord, you've brought it. Now help me experience it. You see what I mean? In other words, God's reality always should dictate our thoughts and comfort us and assuage our fears. His reality is you are clean, you are forgiven, you are alive, you are healed, you are rescued, you are delivered, you're redeemed, you're ransomed. Amen? So that's God's truth toward us because of the cross. So turn, O Lord, save my life, he says. Deliver me for the sake of your steadfast love. In death, there's no remembrance of you. And again, that was the status under the old covenant. In Sheol, who can give you praise? I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eyes waste away because of grief. They grow weak because of all my what? Foes. You see? You see what was going on with Jesus? All those foes were accusing him, bringing charges against him. And there, as he was upon the cross, believe it or not, all those charges became true. You say, what? Right? Christ never sinned. He became sin. He never sinned. But the Bible says he became sin for us so that we would become the righteousness of God. That's right there in the scripture. 2 Corinthians 5.21. The Bible says he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to become sin for us. There it is. That we would become the righteousness of God. And that's what we are now. We are the righteousness of God because he took all of our disobedience, past, present, and future. So as he was on the cross, there he was. He had become sin for us. And his foes were accusing him. In fact, through the cross, as I've mentioned so many times here, the accuser of the brethren, the Bible says, was what? Cast down. He cast him down. In fact, I, I love this passage. So many Christians get all freaked out about the devil, right? I see it all the time. It's almost as if there, there are a lot of devil preachers out there, by the way. Did you know that? You say, what? There are a lot of preachers who want to create fear because fear is a manipulative way to bring people back into the doors, right? If I can convince you that you're in danger, but if you come here, you won't be, right? Then fear is what drives you back in. Watch out, that devil may get you. Actually, you know what it says? The Bible says, be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary, the false accuser, 
goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he what? May devour. May devour. So the question is, can he devour a child of God? No, he cannot. Why? The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, the one who is born of God cannot be touched by the wicked one. Own it. <laughs> Embrace that. The word of God says this in Hebrews chapter 2, that through death, he would destroy him who had the power over death, that is, the false accuser. <coughs> he can't touch you. You're safe in the hands of Jesus. John 10, you are in the hand of Jesus, and he said, no one shall snatch you out of my hand. My Father who gave you to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch you out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. And then the Jews picked up stones to throw at him, and then he said, why are you stoning me for all these good works? And then he, they said, we do not stone you for your good works. We are stoning you because you being a man claim to be God. Isn't that beautiful? Who's more powerful? God or the false accuser? The Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Where sin abounded, what? Grace abounded more. Thanks be to God, 2 Corinthians 2, who always causes us to triumph. The Bible says they overcame by the blood of the Lamb. Not by our works. We have overcome by the blood of the Lamb. He cannot accuse us. He can't. All his accusations fall short. Just remember that. Why? Because Jesus took our sin. Now, this, you probably are wondering, how can you really prove this is talking about Jesus? Verse 8. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. How many of you have ever seen that phrase in the Bible before? Anyone? Look at this. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. You're probably wondering, well, who is this? For the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord accepts my prayer. In fact, Jesus actually said, the Father always hears me. <laughs> Isn't that great? He always hears me. And you know what he prayed in John chapter 17? He prayed this, that none, of his children would be lost. So here's the question. If Jesus Christ has prayed that, and he said that the Father always hears him, well, I'm kind of a fan of logic, right? If Jesus says the Father always hears him, and he prayed that none of his children would be lost, so the question we have to ask ourselves is, are we safe? I say yes. Our trust is in Jesus, not in us. In fact, he says this, this is so beautiful, in John 6, verse 37. He says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will never cast out. What a great promise. And so all we have to ask ourselves is this. Have we come to Jesus? If you've come to Jesus, it is because the Father gave you to Jesus and he's promised you will never be cast out. Why? Jesus paid it all, <laughs> right? All my enemies shall be ashamed and struck with terror. They shall turn back and in a moment be put to shame. And that goes back, they trap themselves, right? That's how they were ashamed, by their own words. They judged God's people, they judged Jesus, and their own words came back to trap them. And guess what happened? In the first century, 40 years after Jesus said, this generation will not pass away until all these things are fulfilled. What happened? Does anybody remember historically what happened? The most significant event in the history of Israel happened 40 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Anyone know? They showed him, the Bible says, 
the disciples showed him the buildings of the temple. And he said, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And they said, tell us, master, when shall these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? He was talking about the end of the old covenant age. And Jesus went on to say, you guys are going to see a bunch of false Christ, which John says this, 1 John, he says in chapter 2, verse 18 and 19, he says, little children, it's the last hour. And we say, well, last hour of what? He says, it's the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist would come, even so now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know it is the last hour. Well, how did he know this? Jesus said, when you see false Christ, know that the end is near. He's not talking about the end of planet Earth. He was talking about the end of the old covenant age, the end of the Jewish temple and Jerusalem. That's what he was talking about. And so he said to the disciples, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, that's who he was talking about. So we're talking about a temple. Imagine this for a second. Imagine all your ancestors for the last 1,800 years worshipped at Jerusalem, and that temple had been there for all those years. Now imagine that for a second. How significant would it be if Jesus now all of a sudden comes along and says, this temple's coming down, folks. It's coming down, and he says, this generation will not pass away until it's fulfilled. Can you imagine what was going on in the minds of those disciples? They're like, dude. <laughs> well, I don't know if they said that. I think that is in the original Greek. <laughs> no, kidding. All right. But you can imagine they were probably shocked, sort of, well, you know how there's that, uh, it's kind of a nice shock, but really, Jesus, you're the Messiah, but you're going to tear down this temple? In fact, he even said to the Pharisees, he says, I am going to leave your house desolate before this generation passes away. And what's amazing is an unbelieving Jew by the name of Josephus. Anyone heard of Josephus? He said, he said this, that when the temple was destroyed, this was the wrath of God on the Pharisees. Josephus said that. And so this is, I believe, what is going on here. In verse 10, all my enemies shall be ashamed, struck with terror. They shall turn back and in a moment be put to shame. And as it's recorded, 1.1 million Jews died in the siege of Jerusalem at the destruction of the temple. 1.1 million Jews. And they were done forever. And that vindicated Jesus' sacrifice. He destroyed the place where they were continually offering up animal sacrifices even after Jesus' sacrifice. And Jesus said, you know what? You guys are continuing to do this when I have made the perfect once for all time sacrifice. And so I'm going to have to destroy your temple. And he did. And we praise God for it. We're excited about that. I mean, we should be really excited about that because guess what? We're the new temple. As Paul said, you are the temple of the living God. He dwells among us, Emmanuel, okay? Now, so how do we know this again? Depart from me, all you workers of evil. Well, where does that, we have to be, sort of familiarize ourselves with the Bible because this phrase is used in Matthew 7. So Jesus says this, and this is really important here. He's talking to the Pharisees who were always saying, Lord, Lord, you know, they were, Jesus says this people, he described the Pharisees this way. This people draws near to me with their lips, but their what is far from me? Their hearts are far from me. So he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my father in heaven. So naturally, we should be asking, well, what's the will of the father, right? I mean, What's the will? Do, do I have to go to church every Sunday? Do I have to go to Sunday school? Holy cow, you can't even do that here. 
<laughs> right? Hopefully, Lord willing, you know, as we grow, we'll, we'll have a Sunday school. Wouldn't that be nice? I think that'd just be really beautiful. But do I, you know, do I have to sing in the choir, right? Do I have to sing solos on a Sunday morning, right? Is, is that what's necessary to enter the kingdom of heaven? No. Let's find out what the Bible says. Only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven on that day, and I believe Jesus was talking about the destruction of the Jewish temple. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? In other words, the focus was on what? Didn't we? Didn't we? Didn't I? Right? And didn't we cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? They were focused on I. And again, this is one of the biggest questions I ask people is if God were to come to you and say, why should I give you eternal life? I should not be in your answer, <laughs> right? It should not be in your answer. If Christ were to say that to us, our answer is what? Because you died for me. That's why. That's all I have, is your death. Again, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Right? Sin had left a crimson stain, but what? He washed it white as snow. It was all him. And that's what we mean when we say, for by what are we saved? Grace. Say that out loud. Grace. Grace. Strong's Concordance defines it as undeserved favor. <laughs> Man, talk about love. Talk about love. We didn't earn it. But these people, didn't we, didn't we, didn't we perform and then Jesus says this to those Pharisees in the first century. He says, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. He's not saying, I once knew you, but you were a bad boy. And then I stopped knowing you. No. He says, depart from me. I never knew you. They were trusting in themselves. They were trusting in their works, their righteousness. He says, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, or as the King James says, depart from me. What do you see in verse 8 of Psalm 6? Depart from me, all you workers of evil. Jesus says, go away from me, you evildoers. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them, you say, well, what does that mean? He says, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on what? The rock. My hope is built on nothing less than what? Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, I what? Stand, all other ground is what? Sinking sand. Our righteousness is sinking sand. So he says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts them on them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my church. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall. What did Peter call the church? You are built up a spiritual house. What are you built on? Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. Amen. It did not fall because it was founded on a rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine, this is the gospel, and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on, there it is, sand. All other ground is sinking sand. And you guys know how I am with 
lyrics and hymns and, and Christmas songs. One of the things that's just been a passion of mine over the years, because I sang, all, I, I swear to you, I knew all these hymns before I knew what they meant. <laughs> I sang all these hymns before I knew what they meant, let alone that they were derived from the Bible. And that's why I spent a lot of time at Christmas really, really emphasizing the words of these wonderful Christmas songs. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, beat against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. And that was the whole house of Israel that was trusting in self-righteousness. It came down. That temple came down. Jerusalem was destroyed. That doesn't make me anti-Semitic. That makes me (laughs) pro-Jesus. In other words, Jesus is saying, look, I've given all y'all that example of the temple that they trusted in. Jesus said that they swore by the temple. They trusted in the temple. And great was its fall. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my father. Are we anxious to find out what that will is? Here's the will. What is his will? He explains it in John 6. This indeed is the will of my Father, that all who see the Son and believe in him may have what? Eternal life. Yeah. And so we ask the question, have we believed only in Jesus for our salvation? Have we trusted only in his payment on the cross? You say, is that really it? Well, let's emphasize it and we'll finish up here. First John chapter three, verse 23. And this is his commandment. It's amazing how many people out there believe that you have to obey the 10 commandments in order to be accepted by God. Sorry, that's an impossibility. I break it every day a thousand times. You say, how do you know that? Because if you've broken them, one of them, how many of them have you broken? All of them, James 2.10. If we have transgressed in one point of the law, we have transgressed all of them. And so I have to add up. Well, let's see. I'm probably at, I think I'm at 327 today. Right? Taryn, how many of you violated today? (laughs) I'm not saying. He's like me. He's, maybe maybe he's at 326. Austin, you're at 328 probably. But anyway, <laughs> I mean, we've broken them a thousand times. Jesus knew that. Just to lust after a woman, we've committed adultery in our heart, Jesus said. And that's where we go. Basically, what it does is it makes us fall into the arms of Christ. Amen. I can't do it. I can't do it. And so we trust in him. I wholly lean on Jesus' name. So this is his commandment. What are the commandments? That we should what? Believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he commanded us. That's good news.